Uh, Secretary, can you go 20, 25 more minutes? But you're anxious for your next uh, guest to join you. Yep. We're, we're anxious to have them too. A few more questions, if you may. Okay. Let's start uh, myself, Mr. Burgess, and whoever else will go at 10 2, we'll cut it off. How's that? Fair enough? Okay. Let me ask this. You know, it seems like we have the Energy Task Force uh, in 2001 saying, let's get our energy going. We have a couple executive orders to expand offshore drilling, uh, get things rolling. It seems like throughout all of our hearings that we've developed a technology to drill deeper and in more sensitive areas, uh, and hopefully we do it in a safe manner, but we never developed the uh, technology to have a cleanup. Is that fair to say? We're still using the same technologies from the 1920s, booms and trying to skim it and burn it off. Uh, fair to say? Uh, um, so let me ask this question. In, in the government models, we always talk about worst case scenarios. Government models, last time they were updated was 2004, and they dealt with surface spills, nothing deep water. In 2005, MMS modeling team recommended that the spill plans need to be upgraded to deal with deep water releases. Any reason why that was not done? Madam Secretary, I think it was, it was 2005, you're still there. Do you, reason, do you remember the report recommending doing some deep water modeling? Because that's what we base Frankly, everything upon. Uh, Congressman, I, I do not. I'm going to ask Secretary Salazar the same thing. That report. Uh, Mr. Kempthorne, any idea that we had that request there that was, was never done? No, Mr. Chairman, I do not. Okay. L let me ask this. You both mentioned the history of um, no spills and, and, and um, internationally, I think, Ms. Uh, Secretary Norton, you mentioned we were uh, looked at favorably. But I'm looking at a report here, CINTIF. Uh, it's dated uh, June, excuse me, July 24, 2001. And it's actually, CINTIF is actually out of Norway, and they were asked to do a report for Minerals Management Service. And in there, they're talking about the study of the BOPs, blowout preventers, and, and what goes wrong and kicks in the wells. And I found this very interesting. Of the 83 wells drilled in deep waters, ranging from 1,300 feet to 6,500 feet, there were a total of, on these 83 wells, 117 BOP failures and 48 well kicks. In this is off 26 different rigs. So if you take a look at that, we have 117 BOP failures, 48 well kicks. So that would be two incidents per well or six incidents per rig. And this report goes on and says an alternative BOP configuration and a BOP test procedure that will improve safety, availability, and save costly rig time has been proposed. Do you ever know whatever happened to this report, Madam Secretary? I don't recall ever seeing it. Okay. And when you did the 2003 rule making, you didn't take this in consideration then because you don't remember seeing it? I would imagine that someone in the Minerals Management Service who had responsibility and who had the technical expertise to evaluate that did so, but I, as Secretary, did not see that. It was interesting that we hired a Norwegian, MMS hired a Norwegian company to do it, and they relied, took, you know, Gulf of Mexico and versus Norway because they're uh, up in the North Sea, and they found that we had more kickbacks, we had more problems with pressure which actually were the issues that led to the problems with Deepwater Horizon. Um, I will conclude my questions right there. I'll turn to Mr. Burgess for five minutes for questions. Well, Mr. Chairman, if Secretary Salazar is here, I'm perfectly prepared for him to come and, and us to begin the second panel. You waving? Well, is, if, if the he, Secretary he, is here, are, are you ready to start the second panel? No, we'll be starting at 2 o'clock. At 2 o'clock. Is the Secretary here? No. Okay. Has he been so watching? So you wave? Has he, no, I'm not going to wave. Has he been watching this on C-SPAN, as you said he might be? Well, that's a good question. You should ask him. I, I mean, I'm offended that we've been here all day. People have been asking good questions and making reasonable statements. And uh, Mr. Burgess, is, you know darn well that the uh, Secretary has his staff here. And, is, and he, he so may very well be watching it, but I haven't Secretary asked. has so little interest that he wouldn't even notice that we were winding down and that the committee has dwindled to a, a, a less than critical mass. Well, let's do. Well, uh, if you have no we, further questions. Oh, no, I do have no. some questions. Okay. Let's uh, let's visit for just a minute some of the questions that Mr. Markey was asking, and then not really allowing for a response. Secretary Norton, when you became secretary and you inherited uh, the, the 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 agency from Secretary Babbitt, um, 
were there specific regulations relating to deep water drilling that had been proposed by the previous administration? Yes, there were some regulations as to blowout preventers and cementing and so forth that had been proposed in 2000. And what was the result of that? Did you proceed with the implementation of those regulations or did you shut them off because it was a new administration? It, they were proposed and then they were in the previous administration in 2000, they were finalized in my administration. There were very few changes that took place between the proposed and the final. The one key thing that we added in to that was a requirement that the companies look at the deep water technology and how they were using uh, stronger pipes and needed to have stronger shear rams in order to deal with those kinds of more hardened pipes. And so we put in place a new requirement that had not been in the previous proposal that required industry to do that. We put in place several requirements in those regulations over the objection of industry. Well, so if that's a deregulatory ticking time bomb that was set in motion that, that really doesn't, that doesn't compute then, does it? No. Was a deregulatory ticking time bomb then started during the Clinton administration? Or is, in fact, the deregulatory ticking time bomb simply a straw dog or a red herring, as the chairman put it to you? Is this just a red herring that he's throwing out? There's no question. I've got a list here. I, I, I referenced earlier some 23 or 25 uh, studies that were done by the Technology and Assessment Research Program. I've got someone who has been kind enough to provide me what must be 100 or 150 such studies 600, I beg your pardon, 600 studies that have been done. Now, not every one of these studies will lead to a new regulation, but the studies are done for good reason to address problems that are out there, but then they become part of the, uh, of, of the investigatory process that leads to the rulemaking that eventually then governs the rules. It would be very difficult to, to run any industry. I'm, my background's in medicine, but if somebody came and sat down 600 new regulations, Oh wait, we may do that. But nevertheless, it becomes very, very difficult to, 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 to run anything with, uh, with, with having this level of regulation. But at the same time, your agency, for both of you, was charged with looking at these things, putting what you thought was up for reasonable proposed rulemaking, and then setting the regulations and setting the rules. Is that not correct? Yes, and there's also, Behind that, a whole set of industry standards, some of which were adopted by MMS and some of which remained industry best practices. And uh, that also took into account, those things were, were changed much more frequently than the regulations to take into account advances and learnings from all these various studies. You know, the, we had the uh, one hearing here where we had uh, I don't know, five or six executives from, from the big oil exploration companies and one of the things that was that really struck me during that morning, of course, everyone said every, five to one said they wouldn't have done what BP did as far as the drilling practices. But the, from the individuals who were here that had actually worked and worked their way up in their companies, had started on the on the offshore rigs, a lot of sensitivity to the fact that you sometimes would have to shut down a well. You sometimes would not be able to bring well in because it was simply too dangerous. And and one of the executives may even made the comment in response to to one of the Democrats' questions, that if you start going too fast, you're going to get someone killed. It is important to have people who've worked in the industry as part of the process. So uh, the, the, the fact that it would be, could be done in some sort of vacuum without, without taking into account the people who actually know how to run the business is, is, is on the face of it, is preposterous. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you've been kind. I'll yield back the balance of my time. And we have, we have others who want to fill the void that Secretary Salazar has left. Okay, it should be noted that you're over. <laughs> You're over your time, but that's all right. Here we go, Mr. Markey, questions, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. Uh, Secretary Kempthorne, you're, you heard me question Secretary Norton earlier on the 2003 decision by the Interior Department to exempt Gulf of Mexico lessees from actually including a blowout scenario in their oil and gas exploration plans. But this policy was also continued in both 2006 and 2008, um, when decisions about the BP uh, Macondo well were being made on your watch. In retrospect, 
Mr. Secretary, wasn't your decision wrong? Shouldn't there have been, in fact, planning for a blowout scenario? Uh, Congressman Markey, <clears throat> I have a great deal of uh, faith in the professionals there at MMS that deal with this, the different levels, uh, the regional directors, et cetera. And again, based upon what had been a 40-year record, um, I, I in, retros in retrospect, do you believe that decision was wrong, informed by what has happened? Again, based on what had been a 40-year history, um, I believe that they took the appropriate action. Was the advice the they gave you wrong? They gave me the best advice that they could Was the advice had. wrong? I will just repeat my answer, sir. You d you're not willing to say the advice you got was wrong? Again, based on the 40 years. And I'm asking you, in retrospect now, was the advice wrong? The advice that I was given based on The advice on that you were given with regards to whether or not uh, there should, in fact, be a closer inspection of a potential for a blowout scenario. Was it right or wrong, the advice you got? At the time, at, based no, on today, the knowledge that they today, had. Today, was it, as you look back, are you willing to say the advice you received was wrong and the policy should have been changed back in 2006 or 2008? Mr. Markey, I don't think we have that hindsight. You have the hindsight. We're looking for wisdom. We're trying to pass legislation. Should that decision have been made given what you know today? I think it's something that can be evaluated. I think that, honestly, that is a completely unacceptable answer. The American people want to know that the people who are making the decisions at the time understand that it was wrong, that a blowout could occur, that a spill could occur that would be catastrophic. And until you are willing to say it was a mistake, then I think it's going to be very hard for the American people um, to accept uh, that we are going to be able to move forward uh, without the likelihood that we will ever see this kind of an accident again if there is a Republican administration that comes back into office again. Well, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Chairman, I think in the atmosphere that this committee was called, the fact that we came here voluntarily, that uh, this assignment of blame is not something that... I am not uh, asking you for blame. I'm asking you if, in retrospect, you still believe that it was the right decision or the wrong decision. I am absolutely not asking for you to say anything other than that. Was the decision wrong? And, Congressman, all I will say is based upon a record and based upon the expertise of the professionals at the time, that is the reality. I know it's the reality, but it would be helpful if you could say we were wrong, we made a mistake. And I understand you don't want to do that, but it's obvious that that was the case. Secretary Kempthon, the environmental impact statement for drilling in the Gulf of Mexico that was prepared by the Interior Department in April of 2007 under your leadership concluded that since blowouts are rare events and are of short duration, the potential impacts to marine water quality are not expected to be significant. And the most likely size of a spill would be a total of 46 hundred barrels total. In retrospect, don't you think that the department's analysis of the impacts of a blowout were inadequate? Wouldn't you agree that that conclusion was wrong? Congressman, I, I would reference back what I said in my opening comments, and that is that even though we had a 40-year track record, that because of the catastrophe that happened 90 days ago, it has reevaluated everything. I will also note that uh, in the current administration's preliminary revised program for OCS 2007 2012, it also uses those same assumptions. Okay. Secretary Norton, um, back in 2004, in terms of spill response, uh, your assumption was in the model you used that there would only be 1,000 barrels of oil that would be spilled. It assumes that. The spill will happen on the surface of the ocean and doesn't include any deep water analysis and it doesn't include the use of dispersants and doesn't even contemplate a blowout that takes days, let alone months, to stop. Um, do you agree now that such a plan was completely inadequate? 
that statement was based on information available at the time. We don't have access to go back to the people who made those recommendations, did that modeling, did all of that. In retrospect, so was, we, was the, we're, were the recommendations we're wrong? I have no idea the context in which that was made. I have no idea what it applied to. I have no idea what was the decision that you're talking about. So I can't yeah. say whether no, it was right or wrong. Should those regulations because I don't change. have any information okay. Point of order. in which I Time has expired. Mr. Gingrey, for questions, please. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Um, Secretary Norton and Secretary Kempthorne, uh, I didn't do this in my opening statement, but I certainly would like to take a brief moment to uh, thank both of you. You're, you're here today at the, the request of the subcommittees to discuss your time at the helm of the Department of Interior during the Bush administration. You're here uh, as private citizens today, and you're doing it voluntarily, and, and I'm deeply appreciative of that, and I think most members of the committee feel the same way. Both of you had interesting experiences with MMS during your tenure. Secretary Norton, you've witnessed um, firsthand the devastation that was caused by Katrina and Rita in 2005, and you had the opportunity to, to see up close and personal how MMS was able uh, to respond uh, to what could have been an ecological disaster. And Secretary Kemphorn, in your testimony, I think you mentioned the issues that arose with some individuals who were summarily dismissed from their positions uh, at MMS due to unethical conduct, I think was what you said. Uh, therefore, both of you, had very unique experience with MMS, and, and, and that leads me to finally have a question. Uh, based on the structures that you had in place at MMS during your tenure, and I'd like to ask uh, both of you to respond to this, if you will, had this accident occurred on your watch, this uh, Deep Horizon uh, tragedy, would you have used that as a means for reorganizing MMS like it was done here recently? The new structure doesn't differ that much from the previous structures because previously the, the revenue aspects of it and the regulatory aspects have always been in separate divisions of MMS. And no, I don't think I would have used it as an opportunity for or as an occasion for reorganization. But that is something that is within the purview of an existing secretary. Certainly. And Secretary Kemp on. Congressman, I, I want, first of all, I want to thank you for your, your comments um, concerning our being here today. Um, it is the purview of the incumbent secretary to organize as deemed appropriate. I think you're raising the question of timing. And in that catastrophe, when those are your human resources, when you need everybody pulling together, I think you want to have as much of an atmosphere that you will work together cohesively instead of having concerns about who may be singled out next. And so it is a, it is a question of timing and uh, the creation of a proper atmosphere. Well, and I, and I appreciate uh, both former secretaries, Mr. Chairman, uh, in their response. And I, and I certainly uh, feel the same way. I mean, you know, you're... Uh, uh, go through all this uh, uh, dancing around, changing, uh, uh, the rearranging, the, as the old expression goes, the, the, uh, the deck chairs on the Titanic, and you come up with a new name, which sounds like, reminds me of vegetarian vegetable soup uh, that I remembered as a kid, and you got a, a whole new name, but have you really done anything? And, and more important than that, though, is the, uh, the, the distraction of uh, trying to do that when the focus really needs to be on on the cleanup and the response and, and uh, you know, it, it just doesn't, I, I think there's a lot of posturing, in my humble opinion, and I think really your response sort of reinforces uh, my, my suspicions in regard to that. Uh, I've got a little bit more time left, so as a follow-up for both of you, can you please comment on the nature of how long, well, or no, on the nature of how a long-term moratorium on offshore uh, energy exploration would negatively impact the economy of the Gulf Coast, and based on your experience, how it would make us more dependent on foreign sources of energy. I realize that may have already been asked, but uh, I wasn't here, and I'd love to hear your response to that. First you, Secretary Norton, and then Secretary Kempthorne. One thing I, I don't think we've 
said before is that you know, when companies make decisions for offshore oil wells, I mean, those, you know, a platform is a multi-billion dollar decision. You need to have some long-term predictability. There are years of planning that go into that kind of thing. And so uh, to have all the drilling rigs be off in other countries because uh, of the moratorium is going to have repercussions far beyond the six months. It's not that you reach the end of six months and then everything goes right back into gear. I mean, there are many, many, many years of delay and uh, of impact of moving jobs away that are potentially involved. Yes, Secretary Kempthorne has a right to respond to that question. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Congressman Gingrey, um, I would preface it by saying I've, I felt it was an extremely appropriate step to do a safety review. They did so. And with regard to, as I recall, it's approximately some 30 drill rigs in the deep water. Of those that were reviewed, it was found that perhaps there was only one situation where there was a noncompliance of some element. But the vast majority of all of the specifics of adherence to the regulations were in place. It was good to pause. It was good to take a look at that. But we also need to consider the big picture, which is the energy security of the country. I believe we are too reliant upon foreign sources of energy. I also believe that this devastation, which has been horrible by every imagination, including the 11 families that grieve, and what it has done to the environment there, but a moratorium will compound the devastation by the economic devastation that will continue by the loss of jobs. And the Gulf Coast region needs an opportunity to recover and not have further devastation. Thank you, and Mr. Chairman, thank you for your indulgence. Before we go to Mr. Scalise, um, Mr. Braley, we have a matter pending with Mr. Braley, asked for the 2010 Oil Spill to Minerals Management Service and the National Environment Policy Act, uh, June 4th, CRS report be entered in the record without objection, that will be done. Also, um, myself, Mr. Waxman, and, and Chairman uh, Markey, uh, we're all referred to different studies, the Shear Ram Capability Study, September 2004, by West Engineering. Another report by West Engineering, the Evaluation of Secondary Invention Methods and Well Control, again, March 2003. The Mini Shear Study, again, by West Engineering, December of 2002. And uh, the SNINTEF report of uh, July 24, 2001. Without objection, those all be made part of record. Mr. Chairman, yes, uh, Mr. Burgess. I also uh, would ask that uh, Governor Jindal's op-ed uh, from the Washington Post from last Saturday be made part of the record. Without objection, be made part of the record. Mr. Scalise, I think we have about three minutes left if you want to ask questions for three minutes. Thank please. you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'll ask both of you, uh, did either of you issue the permit for the Maconda well, for BP to drill the Maconda well? Mr. Morton? Definitely not. No, sir, we did not. And I'm just saying that to point something out. I mean, there are a lot of people in this administration that, that seem to want to run around and, and blame other people for things. Uh, they issued it. There's no doubt. I mean, in the, in the timeline, even submitted in the uh, committee report, it was issued on May 22nd of 2009. And, uh, and neither of you were there. Uh, I think what, what really is amazing to, to me is that it seems like every time there's a problem, this administration wants to try to find somebody else to blame instead of trying to just roll up their sleeves and do their job and help solve the problem. And I think we wouldn't have so many of these issues that we're dealing with, especially the, the issues that my local leaders are facing today, nine, three months later, uh, if the administration was just willing to say, let's do our job, let's everybody get in a room, and when there is a problem, whether it's sand berm, which took over three weeks to issue, Governor Jindal could have protected 10 miles of, of our marsh in the period of time it took to get that permit issued. And still to this day, they're waiting to get an answer back on a rock barrier plan uh, to provide protection to Barataria Bay and some of these other real fragile ecosystems where you've got pelican nests and, and other, uh, uh, another very vital resources. And instead of getting everybody in the room, the approach could be sit in that room and nobody leaves until you figure out a way to get it done. And if this plan on the table is not 
the way to do it and there is no perfect plan right now but whoever's plan is better let's do it but your answer can't just be we're denying your plan and everybody leaves and nothing gets done and more oil gets into marshes that didn't have oil the day before and that's the problem we're facing and so you know maybe they don't want to own up to the fact that they issued the permit and they're trying to blame other people but the bottom line is we just want to get these problems solved and we want the attention of this administration focused on doing their job under the law. The Oil Pollution Act says it's the president's job to protect the coast. Unfortunately, he's not doing that. Our local leaders are trying to do it, and they're being blocked by the federal government. And there's no excuse for that. Um, getting back to the, the moratorium, uh, while there is a moratorium that, that even though the, the federal courts have said is arbitrary and capricious and the, the administration doesn't have the legal authority to issue a moratorium, uh, they're saying that there's not a shallow water moratorium, but in fact, uh, they, there are over 40 permits pending for new drilling in shallow waters, which haven't been issued, so there is a de facto moratorium on shallow water drilling. Uh, can you talk about the differences between shallow and deep water drilling and, and the consequences of having this the shallow water moratorium, which is causing even more job losses, uh, that even though this administration says there is no moratorium, they're not allowing any people to be laid off still to this day? There are you know, often different drilling rigs that are involved in different areas, uh, but whether the moratorium is in shallow water de facto or in deep water, you know, if you're actually going to have projects moving ahead, if you're actually going to have the jobs that come from those projects, you need to have predictability. And so there needs to be overall predictability, a focus on safety, but also a focus on solving the real problems and letting the things that are dependable move ahead. And Mr. Kempthorne? Uh, I, I really can't add anything to that, Congressman. I appreciate that. Okay, and, and I know you both touched on it a little bit, but want to get back to this concept of a, uh, a six-month pause. And when, when Secretary Salazar says, uh, I just want to hold my finger on the pause button for six months, and then at the end of six months maybe let it go and start things up again as if magically everybody just sits around waiting for six months and you start it up again. We're already seeing that some of those deep water rigs are leaving. Uh, some have already signed contracts to leave the country and take those good jobs with it and the energy producing capabilities with it. Uh, and many others are already in negotiations and at some point soon, uh, they're gonna be signing their contracts too. But if you waited uh, for six months, I just wanna address that because I do think it's disingenuous for people to go around and say, there's just a six month pause and then we'll start everything up again. If, if you really do want to, to halt drilling for a long period of time, that's a policy decision and we can debate that, but I don't think it's fair to the American people to insinuate that you can just stop everything for six months and then start it back up again magically and everything will work just fine. If you can both address this, you know, at what point uh, down the road do you severely limit the ability for an industry uh, to come back in a short period of time and in fact maybe years? I know from our hurricane experience with Rita and Katrina that, you know, yes, there was a lot of damage that had to be repaired, but it took far And I commend you on your work in getting, uh, getting those issues addressed quickly. Our times quickly avoided. evaporated, Steve. You know, you know we, we just found Brilliant. it took a whole lot longer for the industry to recover, for the energy production to recover than we would have expected. Secretary Kempthorne, did you want to add something? Very, very briefly, sure. if I may. It, Businesses need to have business plans and need to have predictability. As long as you put this question as to whether or not and when they might be able to come back. Also, we need to put it into human terms. The employees that draw their livelihood from the drill rigs and that entire industry, what do they do for six months during the pause? How do they derive their income for their families? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, that concludes all time for this panel. I want to once again thank Secretary Kempthorne, Secretary Norton, who voluntarily came here, gave up their time to help us with this uh, problem, this disaster that our country is facing. We thank you for your insight and the answer to your, all of our questions. With that, this hearing will be in recess until 2.05. We're going to take a 10-minute break. We'll be right back with the next panel. We're in recess. <laughs>